Welcome to all of you. My name is Gary Jones, and I am the rector here at St. Stephen's Episcopal Church in Richmond, Virginia. We like to say something to people whenever we gather here in prayer. We say something like this, whoever you are and wherever you come from, whatever spiritual tradition, religious background, or none at all, whatever you might believe or not believe, it is truly an honor for us to have you here with us. We are very glad you're here. I love being able to say these words, uh, along with my clergy colleagues here at St. Stephen's and other lay leaders. But I admit, it feels very strange saying them here now in this large, empty church on the third Sunday of Lent, 2020. Worship services take place in this space every day of the week. And also every day, people stop in off the streets to pray, just by themselves. We, we love that. But every now and then, I will stop in this church alone when no one else is here. And I pray for you. I pray for longtime parishioners, uh, people who are now elderly who were baptized here, people who've been here just a few years or who are very new to us. And I pray for people whom I've never met, people whom I look forward to meeting. Every Sunday we open the doors to this place. We have new people here. We especially love, love that. But as I say, I know where many of you tend to sit. I mean, just over here, uh, down at the front, at nine o'clock usually, uh, Kate Roy is always there with Zoe. Uh, often John and Mary and Cabell. Uh, over in the chapel over here can almost always count on, on Adelia. Back here a little closer, always at 11.15, Tom. John and Bev. It just goes on and on. Over on this side, Wesley, uh, L.H., Mary. Um, the Yon family, just a little bit over to the left. Um, back in the back of the church, uh, there's our, our middle school ushers. They're just fabulous. And they love sitting back there in the, in the way back, along with some young families with, um, with babies who might need to scoot out now and then to take care of the baby. You know? And then over in the chapel over here to the left, um, back at the back, Alice and Bill, uh, Gail, sort of in the middle, uh, a little closer, uh, Justin, uh, uh, and Sam Dario, like clockwork, every, every Sunday at 8 o'clock, uh, he would arrive in the same place with his daughter and son-in-law, Lee, uh, after he dropped off his bag of apples for our, our fruit ministry. Uh, and Sam, uh, rest in, may he rest in peace. He, he just died recently uh, at the age of 92. Just a wonderful man and such a great contributor to our common life. Uh, Paul and Jerry, whose, whose daughter tragically died after a long, long uh, illness and a valiant fight on her part. Um, we think of, of all these people, it's just terribly moving for me to come in here, remembering that every time we pray, what we're doing is drawing closer to God. And in doing so, uh, we can often feel it, that being closer to God just means that we are so much closer to each other, even if some are in heaven and some are on earth. And we're trying to find new ways now of, of drawing together in prayer, drawing close to God together. And we hope that this this new online way of worshiping together will actually have some pretty unusual, unexpected and extraordinary uh, benefits, some ways of helping us know more completely what it means to worship in spirit and in truth. And of course, all the while looking forward to a, a time when we're able to actually be physically together again. But for right now, we're refraining from that. We're trying to practice what they call social distancing. We're not able to be together 
and shake one another's hands or embrace each other. We're doing all of that, staying at a bit more of a distance from each other because we love each other. And it's at this point that I'd like to begin, before we begin our prayer time together, before we begin our, our worship, wherever we might be, let me call on Dr. Dick Hamrick, who has been so important to me over the last several days as we've tried to come to grips with this global pandemic and what it means for our common life and what new ministries we might all be called to now in this this extraordinary reality that we're now living in. Uh, Dr. Dr. Richard Hamrick. Gary, you asked me to say a prayer today and uh, I, he wanted me to wear a white coat. It took me a while to find one. Unfortunately, my wife who remembers everything remembered where a white coat might be and I went and found it. The last time I wore this coat was August the 11th, 2017 at the VCU School of Health, School of Medicine white coat ceremony. So we certainly are thinking about all of our young physicians today. But I think importantly for this time, what I found in the other pocket was a bottle of Purell. And that is a reminder that uh, cleanliness of hands is the single most important thing you can do within healthcare, as well as covering your mouth and your nose and your arm when you cough or sneeze. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the gift of this day. We especially remember those who are sick in hospitals or nursing homes or those uh, who are sick at home, sequestered. We think of those who are taking care of them, particularly uh, those who are cleaning the environment to keep everybody safe, our housekeeping staffs. We think of those that deliver the food trays and those that prepare the food in this time of crisis. We remember those who register people at the front desk because otherwise they could not be kept track of while they're in the hospital. And we especially remember our social workers, our physical therapists, our occupational therapists, our doctors, our nurses, our social workers, all those that are trying to take care of the sick and the needy in this time of trouble. Please remember all of us uh, in, on this, in this trying time. Amen. Amen. Some of you have heard me talk about one of the great Anglican theologians of all time, the, the Richard Hooker from the 16th century. Richard Hooker said something fascinating about prayer. He said, every good and holy desire, though it lacks the form of a prayer, has nevertheless the force of a prayer. Every good and holy desire, though it lacks the form, nevertheless has the force of a prayer. Well, by that measure, my sense of you is that you have been praying an awful lot these last several days and weeks because I've been hearing from a lot of you. You can't stop thinking about how grateful you are for the heroic medical professionals who are going the extra mile day and night to care for those who are sick and to try to find some good solutions and answers to this predicament we find our, ourselves in. You find yourselves deeply concerned about your next door neighbor or other members of the church or just perfect strangers, people you might see normally in the grocery store or passing on the street. You're thinking about each other in new ways, deep concern for one another. You know, you, the list go, go, goes on and on. The ways in which, in some ways, we are, we are constantly praying with these good and holy desires, thinking about people all over the world, whether they are in Italy or Iran. And my recommendation, one of them to you, is that you try to find some time to let the, the noise of anxiety and fear recede just a little bit, to be attentive in your own life to those good and holy desires that you have. Because if we're attentive to the prayers of the Holy Spirit bubbling up from within us, extraordinary things start to happen. And I'm already seeing them happen. Uh, just at our farmer's market where we had just a few food vendors to allow people to shop for uh, much needed food in a, in a much safer environment outdoors with vendors spaced farther from each other and volunteers helping 
customers to keep some distance from each other, frequently using hand sanitizer, washing their hands. All of this was just beautiful to see. But the most extraordinary thing is that those with uh, extra canned goods, non-perishables that they thought they could donate, brought those to our food pantry. Because we know this time is going to be a very important time for some who are not able to work the, the way they normally do. And our, our food uh, ministry has already been designated an emergency distribution site. There's a line in the uh, book of the prophet Habakkuk. It goes like this. He says, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. At first, that sounds like a strange thing to say in a big empty church on the third Sunday of Lent, 2020. But today and in the weeks to come, I'd love to consider with you the deeper meaning of that line from Habakkuk. The Lord is in his holy temple. And that temple is you. Remember the words of St. Paul who said, do you not know that you are a temple of the Holy Spirit, that your bodies are the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is in you. That's why, that's why we worry about our neighbors. That's why we're so grateful for healthcare workers and other volunteers who bring food for the needy. It's why we are concerned about people wherever they are, next door neighbor or Iranians, because the Holy Spirit is speaking within us, bubbling up in the midst of all the chaos of our society and reminding us how much every one of us needs each other, how much we love each other, and that our true life is spent serving and caring for one another. So in the weeks to come, uh, when we're not able to be physically together, I hope you'll join us in worshiping this way online. May it be a way that we could all keep the Sabbath holy together. Uh, so if you have a book of common prayer and you can join along with, with your book of common prayer and, and bring your Bible, uh, first turn to page 355 in the book of common prayer. And while you're doing that, Let's listen to an organ prelude by our organist, Brent Tavelda. And one advantage of this way of worshiping is you get to see him playing from a whole new vantage point. And I know it's going to blow your mind. It's just extraordinary, the talent of our incredible musicians. And throughout it all, remember this one important truth. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is in you. Let all the creation keep silence before him.
Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. His mercy endures forever. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you know that we have no power in ourselves to keep ourselves. Keep us both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls, that we may be defended from all adversities which may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts which may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from Exodus. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim. There was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did this, did so, and in the sight of the elders of Israel, he called the place Massa and Merhabah, because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Is the Lord among us or not? Everybody asked that question at one time or another. Our Hebrew ancestors, as we just heard, had such a rough go of it in the wilderness that it became frankly, a community refrain, and they even named a geographic place after their quarreling and testing the Lord. Is the Lord among us or not? I surely have asked the question time and again myself in my own life, and I take some comfort in the fact that even Jesus seems to have asked it, and perhaps the, some of the best known words of the Bible, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Is the Lord among us or not? In the midst of a, a global pandemic, this question, in some form or another, is one that many of us are going to be asking. It's natural, it's what we do. It's understandable. Neuroscientists, in fact, explain to us that our brains, our human brains are like Velcro when it comes to negative or threatening experiences, things that should make us afraid. Our brains are like Velcro about that, by way of protecting us. We've evolved in this way to be hyper alert to threats, things that should make us afraid. And neuroscientists go on to say that our minds are like, well, they're like Teflon, they say, when it comes to positive experiences. People who study the brain say that you have to meditate on positive things like beauty, love, joy, something gorgeous in nature, uh, all the ways in which life is just an extraordinary gift. We have to meditate on these things for a period of time if they are going to stick with us, if we're going to remember them in our daily lives. Otherwise, these beautiful truths about our lives will just slide right off like Teflon. 
we won't notice them as much either. And we'll end up centering our lives on all that is wrong in the world. But remember, our brains are like Velcro concerning negative things. They'll latch right on to things of which we should rightly be afraid. That might be one of the reasons that many of us are so drawn to worship, to dwell on, sometimes on our knees, sometimes standing on tiptoe in joy, to dwell on the goodness of God, the love that we see inside ourselves and inside one another. The love we see in these medical professionals who are working night and day right now, the, the extraordinary compassion we see in people like you who, who bring food for the hungry, who check on their neighbor, who care for the sick, who welcome the stranger, who for a time are refraining from uh, embracing each other because we love each other, people who visit the prisoner, and so on. So while we remember that the reality that from time to time we are all going to ask, is the Lord among us or not? In worship, we also remember how important it is to call each other to a kind of remembrance of the good and beautiful that is in our lives. Mr. Rogers used to like to say to children when they were in distress about difficult things going on in the world, and they would ask, why is this happening? As if, just like the adult question, is the Lord among us or not? In that kind of refrain of fear and anxiety, Mr. Rogers would tell the children, when something like this happens, always look for the helpers. There are always helpers. God is very much among us. God is very much at work. And you only have to look to see people who are doing extraordinary things and caring for one another, praying for each other, uh, to see that God is still at work in this world. And we are going to put our focus there and how we can be most helpful while we refrain from things that we used to do. And so we have our psalm now, Psalm 95, which begins, Come, let us sing to the Lord. Psalm 95, Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with song. For the Lord is the great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee, and kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. My son is love. My Savior's love to me, love to the love that shone that day might love me be. Oh, who am I that at for my sake my Lord should take faith? For his death, they 
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus came to a Samaritan city called Sinkar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well? and with his sons and his flocks drank from it. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped in this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. We were astonished that he was speaking to a woman, but no one said, what do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say, Four months more, then comes the harvest. But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting the reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I have sent you to reap that for which you do not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the women's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. 
and many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. The Gospel of the Lord. That was a long Gospel reading, but it is a, a beautiful story. And there's so much to say about it, but for now, maybe it's enough to focus on Jesus' words to the woman at the well, where he says, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when it's not going to matter precisely where you worship, whether in this place or that. The hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for such the Father seeks to worship him. Obviously, we're not able to be in any particular place right now together because, again, because we love each other. So maybe we're being forced to ask ourselves, what does it mean to worship God in spirit and in truth? Well, one hope I have is that this way of worshiping together online and hearing from voices all over the city in the weeks to come will be a way for us to remember just how we belong to each other, how much we need each other in this life, and how good it will be, of course, when we're able finally to be physically together again. It's no secret that our American society right now is deeply divided and polarized, and some people have speculated that this outbreak of a coronavirus could make things worse in that regard, more deeply separating us from one another and causing people to retreat into the echo chambers of their social, social media uh, communities and television. But maybe this way of worshiping for a season, maybe this way of putting together voices of people from all over the city, many of whom you'll know and, and some you will not know but have long wished you could meet in person. Maybe this way of worshiping could have the opposite effect of sending people into their separate corners in life. Maybe it could draw us together. Having people from the East End to the West End in worship, from the city jail to area hospitals, helping us all to learn again what it means to worship in spirit and in truth, in the spirit of love and the reality that we need each other. In peace we pray to you, Lord God, for all people in their daily life and work, for our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone. For this community, the nation, and the world. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. For the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the Gospel, and all who seek the truth. For all bishops and other ministers. For all who serve God in His Church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation. Hear us, Lord, for your for mercy, mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We will exalt you, O God, our King, and, and praise, praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. We put their trust in you. The peace of the Lord be always with you. 
and also with you. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Is there anything more beautiful that we could say to each other? Wishing the peace of the Lord for our family and friends. Wishing the peace of the Lord for perfect strangers. And even, according to Jesus, wishing the peace of the Lord even for our enemies. It's the most extraordinary thing of the gospel, is an extraordinary truth. And the ancient uh, Christians found it particularly profound. This part of our worship together, exchanging the peace, was ex of extreme importance to the early church because they actually believed that if they could be at peace with one another, wishing the peace of the Lord for each other, they would be at peace with God. After all, each of us in our bodies is the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not dwell in a temple of stone, but in the temple of our own bodies. The peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. It was so important in the early church that they kissed each other at the peace. It was a little scandalous for some to see the way Christians so uh, joyfully embraced one another. Today we tend simply to shake hands or maybe a modest sort of embrace and worship, sometimes quite enthusiastic in some churches. The peace of the Lord be with you. But how do we express this desire for the peace of the Lord in one another's lives during a time when we are having to refrain from being close together and touching, no embracing. We're having to worship online like this. This is a challenge, but I think more importantly, it might be a great opportunity. If we spend our time trying to think about how can I express my desire for the peace of the Lord in other people's lives during this time when we cannot be physically together, God will take that good and holy desire, that natural prayer, and take this time of great trial, tribulation, and turn it into something extraordinarily good. I'm already seeing it in so many of you. One Bible study group here says, uh, wrote to me just the other day and said, Gary, we've decided we shouldn't meet together in a room somewhere at church, so we're just going to meet and keep appropriate distance from each other. We're just gonna walk the neighborhood together and express our love for each other that way instead of sitting in a room studying the Bible. Another person, uh, Doug, wrote me just today and said, Gary, I, I, he saw all, how all people were bringing uh, food donations for people who are hungry. He said, I wonder if we might check on our neighbors who, who perhaps need medicine or something else that they just cannot get out and tend to themselves. In extraordinary ways, you're already thinking. One other person on staff said, we have got to be especially mindful now of those people who are not able to work. They desperately want to work. One of our major outreach programs right now is an employment assistance program in the east end of Richmond called Rework Richmond. Well, this is all about tending to people who are so eager to work, but simply have been kept from work for some time. This is going to be a, a time of real trial for us, but a time of great opportunity to spend time with your good and holy desires let them bubble up from within you, from that Holy Spirit dwelling within you. And let's see what God is going to bring about in this time of some tribulation. God bless you and bless one another. Be of good courage, never be afraid, because God who created you is always with you and loves you fiercely. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you this day and forevermore. Amen. Be at peace. God, whose very own you are, 
will lead you safely through all things. And when you cannot stand it, God will carry you in his arms. The same understanding Father who cares for you today will take care of you then and every day. Amen. Thank you.